On the evening of September the 19th, 1961, the Hill family of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, undergoes a traumatic event that marks them deeply. Betty and Barney Hill are returning home from vacation when they suddenly spot an unusual illuminated aircraft in the sky. Immediately after the sighting itself, the couple are taken on board by the mysterious crew of the aircraft and are subjected to a series of disturbing tests and procedures. The Hills are the first to claim to have suffered an alien abduction and their story has become one of the most famous and discussed cases in the history of ufology. Months after the kidnapping, Barney begins to suffer from severe anxiety and both he and his wife are also prey to frequent and recurring nightmares. The couple turns to a psychiatrist and through numerous regressive hypnosis sessions is able to relive the kidnapping and remember the details of their terrifying experience. This documentary is an exploration of the Hill kidnapping and its lasting effects. We will analyze what happened that night in 1961 and the impact it had on the Hill family for the rest of their lives. We will also analyze the evidence and eyewitness accounts and explore the countless theories that have been put forward over the years. Discover with us the truth behind the most famous alien abduction case in history. It is a quiet September evening, to be precise, September the 19th, 1961. The sun is slowly setting, casting a golden glow over the White Mountains. The couple, Betty and Barney Hill, are driving in their old Chevrolet Bel Air, with the windows down, enjoying the view. The trees are illuminated by the fading sunlight, giving the woodland a mystical feel. The two are driving to their home in Portsmouth after a short, abruptly interrupted vacation in Canada. The couple enjoys the tranquility of the journey, lost in their own thoughts while the radio plays in the background. A news report interrupts the music with an update on the weather conditions. A hurricane is moving up the coast and could reach as far as New Hampshire. The two exchange a worried look. Barney decides to put the pedal to the metal, hoping to be able to get home before the storm arrives. The car's engine roars as they zoom along the mountain roads of the US Route 3, the trees blending into the distance. The sun has now set, leaving behind an orange and pink sky, which slowly begins to darken as night falls and the stars become more knitted in the sky. According to Barney's estimate, they should reach home by three in the morning. Ahead of them, a long drive under a bright starry sky, along the quiet roads that cross the mountains and small rural villages, among them Coldbrook. The couple therefore decide to make a quick stop at the town's restaurant before facing the long journey that awaits them. They leave the restaurant around 10.05 p.m. to get back on the road as soon as possible. Now the stars are bright in the sky, as always in the mountains of New Hampshire on a cloudless night. Betty enjoys the incredible view of the moon reflecting off the distant valley, both in New Hampshire to the east and across the river to Vermont to the west. Delcy, the hill's little dachshund, sleeps peacefully on the floor in front of the passenger seat, at Betty's feet. To the left of the moon, and slightly below it, Betty notices a particularly bright star, with a constant glow. After passing the town of Lancaster, she is amazed at the appearance of a new celestial body, just above the one she had just seen. Her amazement slowly becomes a certainty. That strange star, so clear in the sky, was not present a few moments earlier. The luminous dot appears to get larger and its light more intense with each passing moment, as if it were in motion. 
Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Hill points it out to her husband, who gently presses on the brake pedal to slow down and observe the strange light outside the windshield. Barney isn't worried about it. Indeed, he exclaims that he considers them lucky, as according to him, they are looking at a satellite that has gone off course and is following the rotation of the Earth. It almost looks like a moving star. The star disappears and reappears as the trees interrupt the view. The couple begin to wonder if the star's alleged movement is related to their motion in the car. The old car stops at a stop sign and Betty tells her husband to pull over. She takes out the binoculars bought especially for their holiday to observe the strange star with them. Delcy, their dog, begins to become more and more restless. Barney pulls over at a scenic picnic area south of Twin Mountain and Betty rushes out of the vehicle to observe the star, puts the binoculars to her eyes and focuses carefully. What the both of them are about to witness, even if at that moment they are unaware of it, will change their lives forever and, as some observers claim, will revolutionize the course of world history. An aircraft with flashing multicolored lights passing across the moon. Betty thinks she is looking at a flying saucer, influenced by the story of a sighting her sister had had. At that point, Barney takes his wife's binoculars and observes what, according to him, is an airplane traveling towards Vermont, bound for Montreal, but soon changes his mind, because without giving the impression of having veered, the aircraft descends rapidly, approaching the couple. Barney states that this object that looks like an airplane is not an airplane. The two of them, at this point, quickly return to their car and head towards Franconia Notch State Park along a narrow and mountainous stretch of road. The hills say that they continue driving along the isolated road, traveling very slowly through Franconia Notch to watch the object as it got even closer. At one point, the flying object passes over a restaurant and signal tower atop Cannon Mountain and reappears near the Old Man of the Mountain. Betty testified that the object was at least one and a half times the length of the granite cliff, which was 12 meters long, and that it appeared to rotate. The couple watched the silent, illuminated craft as it moves erratically and bounces back and forth in the night sky. About a mile south of Indian Head, they claim the object rapidly descended towards their vehicle, causing Barney to stop in the middle of the highway. The huge, silent object hovers about 80 to 100 feet above the hill Chevrolet and fills the entire field of view from the windshield. It reminded Barney of a huge pancake. With a gun in his pocket, he walks away from the vehicle and approaches the aircraft. Using the binoculars, Barney sees 8 to 11 humanoid figures peering out of the windows of the spaceship, who appear to be watching him. In unison, all but one of the figures move towards what appears to be a panel on the back wall of the corridor surrounding the front of the spaceship. The only remaining figure keeps looking at Barney and sends him the message, stay where you are and keep watching. Barney recalls observing humanoid forms wearing shiny black uniforms and black caps and then red lights on what appear to be bat wing things beginning to emerge from the sides of the craft and a long structure descending from underneath it. At that point, Barney runs to his car in an almost hysterical state, yelling at Betty, they're going to capture us. The object moves its position directly above the vehicle. The two drive away as fast as possible. Betty rolls down the window 
and looked up. Almost immediately, the hills hear a rhythmic series of beeps or buzzes, which they say seem to bounce off the trunk of their vehicle. The car vibrates and a tingling sensation runs through their bodies. A second series of beeps and buzzes bring the couple back to full consciousness. They realize they have traveled nearly 35 miles south, but have only vague and fragmentary memories of driving along this stretch of road. They have memories of making a sudden, sharp, unplanned turn, encountering a checkpoint and observing a fiery orb on the road. Arriving home around dawn, the hills say they experienced strange sensations and urges they could not explain. Betty insists that they keep their bags by the back door rather than taking them into the house. Their watches had suddenly stopped working. Barney notices that the leather strap on the binoculars was torn, though he doesn't remember how it happened. Portsmouth, New Hampshire is a port city located on the banks of the Piscataqua River. It is one of the oldest cities in the United States, famous for its historic landmarks, including old houses, colonial fortifications and US Navy warships. An extremely peaceful place, accustomed to tourism and considered by all to be a nice place to live. Nobody would have considered it a place where such gruesome events would have occurred. From that day, the life of two ordinary people is turned upside down, bringing different elements before the critical eye of the public. One thing that is unusual for that period is undoubtedly the fact that the Hills form an interracial couple. Barney is in fact a proud member of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People a civil rights organization of the United States which began in 1909 as an interracial effort to promote justice for African Americans. While Barney is busy with the NAACP and his postal service job, Betty is a social worker active in the local Unitarian congregation. The trip for their holidays was Barney's spontaneous idea, who, shortly before, had been assigned to the night shift of the Boston Post Office where he worked as a sorting assistant. Though the harsh realities of the New Hampshire winter would soon be upon them, the roads would be clear and traffic would be light, the perfect conditions for a leisurely road trip. That morning, the couple playfully plan their trip over a cup of hot coffee, but Betty thinks it's an excellent idea. Their lack of immediate funds is partially compensated for by Betty's idea to borrow a car fridge from a friend. In this way, the expenses for meals in restaurants would be reduced. They would travel leisurely, avoiding highways, make a short visit to Niagara Falls, tour Montreal and then return to Portsmouth. But, as previously mentioned, their vacation will not turn out at all as the couple had expected. Once they get home after the incident, Betty grabs the leash and takes Delcy for a walk for some morning air, while Barney unloads the car. The chirping of the birds accompanies Betty's thoughts, which still haunt her. Barney is also thoughtful and they talk little. For a reason she can't pinpoint, Betty asks Barney to put their bags in the back hallway instead of taking them into the house. He kindly agrees and then continues to unload the car. Reaching for the binoculars, he notices something unusual. The leather strap he put around his neck the night before is torn in half. After Betty's morning walk, the two sit down at the kitchen table over a cup of coffee, but not before Barney goes to the bathroom to check his lower abdomen, which, for seemingly inexplicable reasons, is sore. After coming out of the bathroom, the two talk about what happened, 
and decide not to tell anyone about it. The latter part of their trip remains extremely vague. They remember almost nothing of the journey from Indian Head to Ashland. They have some fragmentary recollection of the Plymouth Crossing, just north of where they heard the second set of beeps. Barney is baffled and confused by the absence of sound in the strange vessel. He tries to classify it as a normal aircraft, despite its completely foreign appearance and the otherworldly feeling it aroused in him. The two, however, do remember two series of distinct beeps. Their recollections are similar, even if fragmentary, and both speak of a large, luminous, moon-shaped structure which seems to touch the road while remaining stationary under some pine trees. Betty, forcing herself to remember, thinks that Barney made a sharp left off Route 3, but she has no way of identifying where this might have happened. When they see the moon-shaped object, Barney vaguely remembers telling Betty, Oh no, not again. Betty recalls her reaction to Barney's denial that it could have been an unidentified flying object. She thinks, that's how Barney is. If something scares him or he doesn't like it, he just tells himself it never happened. Barney looks at the clothes he wore the night before and to his astonishment discovers that his best shoes are badly scuffed along their tops. For a moment, he is puzzled by the numerous smudges around his trouser leg bottoms and on his socks, until he remembers walking in the open plain of Indian Head. Barney, who pays particular attention to dressing well, can't understand why the tops of his shoes are so ruined. Finally, he thinks that somewhere in that field, he dragged the tops of his shoes on some rocks he doesn't know exactly how, and pretends he doesn't care. The sudden memory of the incident in the field near Indian Head made him go to the back door and look up at the sky again. He expects something, but doesn't know what it is. He struggles to remember what happened after looking through the binoculars and running back to the car, but nothing comes to mind. During the morning, he talks about it with Betty, who presses him on why he rushed back to the car in a state of agitation, and why he thought that they would have been captured, and why didn't he hear her yell to get back into the car. Barney also feels an unexplained pain in the back of his neck. Their intention to maintain absolute confidentiality about their experience begins to waver during that same morning. Barney seems to maintain the idea that keeping their story hidden is their best option. But Betty, in light of her sister Janet's experience several years earlier, still wants to try to share it with her sister. Barney, to reassure his wife, reluctantly accepts. Betty goes to the phone and calls Janet, feeling some relief as she vents her story to an understanding listener. Janet, who has no reservations about the possibility of a UFO sighting, confirms Betty's growing feeling that the car or their clothes may have somehow been exposed to radiation. Janet reminds her sister that her next door neighbor is a physicist, arguing that she could turn to him, asking what evidence there might be to confirm radiation exposure and whether, in fact, the object had approached the car. Betty stays on the phone waiting for her sister, who returns after a few moments. Janet reports the physicist's opinion, who claims that any ordinary compass would be able to demonstrate traces of radiation. If the compass needle were to be disturbed in contact with the surface of the car, it would confirm the vehicle's exposure to radiation. Barney's skepticism, who overhears Betty's part of the phone conversation, is steadily growing. While she hurries to find the compass, her husband decides not to cooperate. 
Finding the compass, Betty rushes out, ignoring the rain. She runs the compass along the wet sides of the car. The needle does not react, but as she approaches the trunk, her attention is drawn to an unusual sight. A dozen or more round shapes, each perfectly circular and about the size of a silver dollar. They are very shiny and contrast with the surface of the rest of the trunk of the car, as if the paint had been rubbed through a circular stencil. At this point, she remembers that the strange beeps they heard the night before came from the rear of the vehicle. In the emotional state Betty is in after talking to her sister, she is astounded at the sight of those strange, round, shiny marks. She carefully places the compass on one of the marks. The needle immediately begins to swing. Almost in a panic, Betty places the compass on the side of the car, where there are no strange marks, but the needle reacts normally, remaining pointed in one direction. To be sure of what she has just seen, Betty moves the compass again to one of the marks found a few moments before, and the magnetic needle starts rotating once again. Betty runs quickly inside the house to confront her sister and her husband. Janet, while her sister is experimenting with the compass, talks to the former captain of the police department of the Newton, New Hampshire area, who is visiting her home that day. He immediately suggests that the Hills notify the Pease Air Force Base in Portsmouth, an Air Force strategic command installation that has received a steady number of UFO reports in New Hampshire in recent months. He receives instructions on this procedure following a spate of UFO sightings in New Hampshire. Betty is haunted by the thought that they may have been exposed to radioactivity, though she realizes that the Air Force base officers may mistake her account for a joke. However, she calls the base, and after several calls placed to the switchboard, she finally finds an officer who asks her for details. The attitude of the cynical and uncommunicative officer leads Betty to recount the events in a vague way, skipping the details relating to the vision of the double row of windows, believing that this would have made her the target of further cynicism. Among the elements that Betty chooses to tell, she mentions the fins that seem to separate on the sides of the aircraft, with two red lights on both sides. This specific detail attracts the officer's attention, and when she suggests that her husband has clearer memories than hers regarding the structure of the flying object, the officer asks to talk about it with Barney, who is initially reluctant, but gives in to the requests of his wife. Mr. Hill cooperates by providing every little detail that he can remember, but fails to mention the figures he clearly observed in the craft. At a certain point in the conversation, the officer informs Barney that he is putting him in touch with another employee at the base, and that the call is being monitored. From the discussion with the officer, Barney learns of other accounts, some similar to his own. He feels relieved, having thus ruled out the possibility of being considered irrational in reporting something without an apparent explanation. Both of the hills, however, do not recount the perfect and somewhat unusual marks on their car. And Barney continues to hesitate about revealing the figures he saw aboard the vehicle behind the curved windows. He feels that it would put him in the position of having more concerns to handle than he already has. His main concern is his reputation. The next day, his worries are further reduced when he receives a second call from the airbase, which is intent on listening once more to the story of what happened. It is Major Paul W. Henderson of the 100th Bomb Wing at Pease Base, who calls back, notifying the Hills that he has been up all night working on the case report and that he needs more information. His official report to Project Blue Book, the name of the Air Force unit at Wright-Patterson Field, Ohio, 
which handles the thousands of UFO sightings from across the country, indicates the hills needn't worry about being laughed at. Here we quote the official report. On the night of the 19th, 20th of September, between 2001 and 200100, Mr. and Mrs. Hill were traveling south on Route 3 near Lincoln, New Hampshire, when they observed, through the windshield of their car, a strange object in the sky. They noticed it because of its shape and the intensity of its lighting as compared to the stars in the sky. The weather and sky were clear at the time. A short time later, Betty goes to the library to learn more about unidentified flying objects. She is disappointed with the supply of books on the subject. However, one essay catches her attention. The Flying Saucer Conspiracy, written by Major Donald Kehoe. Kehoe's thesis indicates that the Air Force is dedicated to discrediting all UFO sightings. A former Annapolis graduate and Marine Corps Major, Kehoe is instrumental in establishing an organization in Washington, known as the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. The committee was established to correlate and analyze every filed UFO sighting in an effort to find a solution to the mystery and to prepare the public, if necessary, to the possibility that the objects may be extraterrestrial spacecraft of unknown origin. NICAP, as Major Kehoe's organization is known, has come to the conclusion that there are basically only two explanations for the constant reporting of UFOs around the world every year. One, a widespread and currently unexplained delusion on such a vast scale that it should, in itself, be a matter of urgent scientific study. And two, people see maneuvered and apparently controlled objects in the atmosphere. NICAP members, many of whom are reputable scientists, professors, technicians, pilots and high-ranking former military officers, argue that the latter hypothesis is more reasonable and that it is based on empirical observations. In its thoroughly documented study, The UFO Evidence, the organization analyzes 575 technical reports and other reliable reports from 46 states, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Canada, and other countries around the world. Reading this wealth of information leads Betty to take courage and write an exhaustive letter to the president of the foundation, in which she is willing to reveal even those details that her husband continues to hide. About 10 days after the sighting, Betty begins having a series of disturbing and particularly realistic dreams. The nightmares continue for five consecutive nights, and she is convinced that she does not remember such precise and engaging dreams from her past. After those five nights, Betty claims she has never had similar dreams again. They have inexplicably vanished. These sinister sleep trips remain so impressive and of such importance as to induce Betty to hesitate to talk about it with Barney, who is on duty during those five nights, remaining in the dark about his wife's uneasy sleep. One day, Betty casually mentions that she finds it difficult to sleep peacefully, having a series of worrying and intense nightmares. Barney shows understanding, but is not worried, and the matter is no longer discussed. A few weeks later, another puzzling incident occurs that neither Barney nor Betty can explain. They are driving in their car in the countryside near Portsmouth, along a road in a sparsely populated area. In front of them, a parked car partially blocks the road. 
A group of people are standing outside the car and Barney begins to slow down gradually to avoid an accident. Suddenly Betty is overcome with fear. She can't explain it, not even to herself. Barney, she says, Barney, keep going, please don't slow down. And losing all control, she opens the car door on the passenger side with the irrepressible impulse to jump out and run. Her husband is scared and tries to figure out how to help her. Betty is in a panic. Without asking any more questions, Barney accelerates as fast as possible despite the presence of pedestrians, and Betty's state of panic disappears. She has never lost control like this before. The impact of that unheard of incident remains the blurred background of their thoughts for many days to come, as well as the effect of the nightmares on Betty, which, despite being absent, continue to prevent her from peaceful rest. Realizing that Barney is trying to forget the UFO event, Betty refrains from mentioning her sleepless nights in order to avoid unpleasant conversations with her husband. However, she begins to ask some close friends for outside opinions, one of whom is a colleague of hers who urges her to write about her dreams in hopes of exorcising her own fears. Feeling that this might ease her constant state of anxiety, Betty sits down at the typewriter, allowing those horrendous images to appear on paper in the form of frightening but helpful prose. Her dreams are unusual in subject and detail. They reveal that she encountered a strange roadblock on a lonely New Hampshire road. Figures approach the car, a strange group of individuals in identical uniforms. When they reach the vehicle, the woman falls into a state of unconsciousness. When she awakens, she realizes she is aboard a disturbing, apparently flying structure together with her husband. Here she is subjected to a thorough physical examination by what must be intelligent humanoid beings. Barney is dragged along a corridor that follows the profile of the ship. Probably he too is being used as a guinea pig. In Betty's dream, the humanoid beings reassure the couple by communicating that following the experiments, she would not have suffered any type of physical or mental damage, nor would she have remembered anything. Betty's written words about these dreams are remarkably detailed, with full descriptions of the craft, the examinations, and the strange scientists. The letter that Betty sent to director Kehoe describes in detail the events of that terrible night, and it was an important preview of the events that would follow. Betty and Barney evaluate the possibility of undergoing hypnosis sessions, induced by the accursed need to remember what actually happened to them. The letter also attracted the attention of the well-known Walter N. Webb, an astronomer and member of NICAP known for his rich research related to the truth about the UFO phenomenon. Webb, initially very skeptical, however decides to go to Portsmouth to talk to the couple and make sure that they are not desperate people looking for fame and attention and to verify the presence of a potentially disconcerting truth. The researcher decides not to be influenced by prejudices and still wants to listen to their stories. Once he arrives at the Hill home, Webb begins what will turn out to be a more than six hour long interview, after which he declares, We skipped lunch and we went on all afternoon into the evening. During this time, I questioned them, both together and separately. I tried to catch them out somehow, but couldn't. I just couldn't. Theirs was an ironclad story. They seemed to me to be a sincere and honest couple returning home from vacation, late at night on a lonely road, when suddenly something completely unknown and indefinable fell upon them. Something alien and foreign to their existence. Five days later, Webb completed his report for NICAP in Washington, examining the incident in minute detail studying the position of the moon and planets, the weather conditions, and a detailed description of the object, including the drawings 
the Hills had provided. The long document drawn up by Webb ends like this. After questioning these people for more than six hours and studying their actions and personalities during this time, there is no doubt that they were telling the truth and that the incident occurred exactly as reported, except for a few small uncertainties and technicalities that must be tolerated in any such observation where human judgment is involved, the exact time and duration of visibility, the apparent size of the object and occupants, the distance and height of the object, etc. While their occupations don't particularly qualify the witnesses as trained scientific observers, I was struck by their intelligence, apparent honesty, and obvious desire to get to the facts and dig into the more sensational aspects of the sighting. Mr. Hill was a complete UFO skeptic before the sighting. In fact, the experience had so shaken his reason and his sensitivity that evidently his mind had failed to adjust. In conversation with me and with his wife after the sighting, there was a mental block when he spoke of the leader who was peering at him from the window. Mr. Hill thinks he saw something he doesn't want to remember. He said he was not close enough to see the facial features of the figures, although at another time he referred to one of them looking over his shoulder and smiling and the leader's expressionless face. However, I think the obscuration of the observer is not of great importance. I think the whole experience was so improbable and fantastic that it testified that his mind finally refused to believe what his eyes were perceiving, and a mental block occurred. The document drawn up by Webb causes a sensation within NICAP, and the Hill case is also observed by the scholars C.D. Jackson and Robert E. Holman, who visit the spouses in November 1961. After reading Webb's initial report, Jackson and Horman formulate several questions and hypotheses for the couple. The main doubt they have concerns the duration of the trip. Although the Hills noted that they arrived home later than expected, they did not realize that they arrived home seven hours after leaving Colebrook. When Holman and Jackson point out this discrepancy to the Hills, the pair find no explanation. This phenomenon is referred to in ufology as missing time. The spouses tell the scholars they can remember almost nothing about the 35-mile US Route 3 between Lincoln Indian Head and Ashland. Both claim to have seen a glowing orb near the Earth. Up until then, Betty and Barney think it's the moon, at which point Herman and Jackson feel compelled to inform them that the moon had already set by that time. During the long interview, the Hills also address the topic of hypnosis, reaching the conclusion that it is the best solution for recovering faded memories. In the winter of 1962, the Hills often drive into the White Mountains on weekends, with the hope that revisiting the place will bring up more memories. They are unable to find the exact spot where they are sure they saw the glowing orb on the road. However, they can still eliminate several possible paths. On November the 23rd, 1962, the Hills attend a meeting at their church rectory attended by a guest speaker, Captain Ben H. Sweat of the United States Air Force. Being interested in hypnosis, the Hills approach Sweat privately and recount their strange encounter. Sweat is particularly interested in the missing time element of the Hill's tale. At that point, the spouses decide to ask the captain if there were any possibility of having hypnosis sessions guided by him, and Sweat informs the couple of a professional hypnotist. The first public discussion by the two spouses dates back to March the 3rd of the following year. The telling of the story of those mysterious events takes place at their parish, in front of a small group of faithful. On September the 7th, 1963, Captain Sweat returns to the same parish to hold a new formal conference 
on hypnosis. After the conference, the Hills inform the captain that Barney is beginning a course of psychological support at the office of Dr. Stevens. Captain Sweat suggests asking the doctor about the use of regressive hypnosis applied to cases such as theirs. During the subsequent meeting with Dr. Stevens, Barney gathers his courage and decides to ask the fateful question about hypnosis. The man appears apprehensive despite his initial skepticism and directs the couple to his Boston colleague, Benjamin Simon. The Hills meet Simon for the first time on December the 14th, 1963. During their first talks, Simon claims that the UFO encounter is causing Barney far more worries and anxieties than he is willing to admit. Simon, like many before him, remains very skeptical about the kidnapping issue, but has only one certainty. Regardless of the truthfulness of the facts, he does not see anything fake in the stories of the couple. They are really convinced that they saw something inexplicable that night. Only hypnosis can bring the truth to surface. Through therapeutic use, regressive hypnosis has the function of bringing out memories and emotions lost in the unconscious. The actual sessions begin in the winter of 1964, preceded by some test sessions. What you are about to hear is the outcome of these gruesome hypnosis sessions. I look up through the windshield of the car and, and I see a star. And it's funny, but I said, Betty, that's a satellite. And then I pull over it and to the side of the road and, and Betty jumped out her side with the binoculars. And, and I got the chain and I hook it to the dog and her collar. And, and I said, come on, Delcy, let's get out. And she jumps out. And I look towards the sky and I look back to Delcy and walk her around to the trunk of the car. And I'm saying, hurry up, Betty, so I can get a look. And, and Betty passes the binoculars to me. And I see that it's not a satellite. It's a plane. And I tell Betty this and, and give the binoculars back to her. And, and I'm satisfied. What kind of plane was it? I look and it's, it's to the right. It doesn't go where I thought it would go. It doesn't go past me to the right, my right shoulder. I think it will pass my right shoulder off in the distance, going to the north. I am facing west, and, and my right is to the north. And, uh, and it doesn't go to the north. Does it have propellers? Uh, well, I think this is strange. I cannot tell. I cannot hear a motor to know if it has propellers. Was your engine running? My engine was running. How about the noise that it had been making before you had your car greased? Oh, it was not making this noise. and I did not pay attention to my engine running. I, I was concerned that it would cut off while I was standing here with all the lights on in the car and, and the battery runs down. And I was concerned and uh, I looked at the exhaust and, and could tell that smoke was still coming from the exhaust. So I did not concern myself too much after that. And this object that was a plane was was not a plane. It was, um, it was funny. It was coming around towards us. I looked up and down the road and, and I thought, how dark it is. What if a, what if a bear was, was to come out? And I was worried. And I returned to the car and said, let's go, Betty. It's nothing but a plane. And, and they're coming over this way and they're changing course. Probably it's a Piper Cub. A Piper Cub would only have one or two windows, wouldn't it? You saw windows in this plane. This is what I said. This is what I saw when I returned to my car. A Piper Cub. And I drive and Betty is still looking. And she said, Barney, this is not a plane. It's still following us. And I stop and I look and I see it's still out there, off in the distance. So I, I search for a place to pull off the road and and I see a dirt road to the right on the main highway. And I think this is a good place where I can pull off. 
and if the, any car comes, it won't strike me. And um, and I get out of the car, and I'm thinking, this is strange, because it's still there. And Betty said, I think she said, I am mad with her. I said to myself, I believe Betty's trying to make me think this is a flying saucer. And I'm wondering, why does it go away? And I stop, and I look again, and I see where it has gone up ahead of us on Cannon Mountain. And I think when I get past Old Man on the Mountain, it will be a, in a good area to look and see this thing, and I'm going to report it. Do you still think it was a Piper Cub? I'm wondering if these pilots are military, and they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't do that. They will make some person have an accident by flying around like that. And what if they dive at me? And the military should not do that. Was it a single-engine plane? I don't know. Uh, I saw no propellers. It was just a light moving through the sky, and I heard no noise. And I think this is ridiculous. Betty, this is not a flying saucer. Why are you doing this for? You want to believe in this thing, and I don't. And it's still there. And I wish I could pass a state trooper or someone, because this is dangerous. And Betty is, is making me mad. She's making me angry because she's saying, Look at it. It's strange. It's not a plane. Look at it. And I keep thinking, it's got to be. And I want to hear a hum. I, I want to hear a motor. How far away was it? It was, um, it wasn't far. It was, um, about 1,000 feet, I guess. If it were a Piper Cub, do you think it would have been silent at this distance? I don't. I know it's not a Piper Cub. It, it was too fast. It, it moved too fast. It will go up and down, and it could go back so fast, and it could go away and come back. I, I want to wake up. You're not going to wake up. You're in a deep sleep. You are comfortable, relaxed. This is not going to trouble you. Go on. You can remember everything now. It's over on my right. God, what is it? And I try to maintain control so Betty cannot tell I'm scared, but God, I'm scared. It's all right. You can go right on. Experience it. It will not hurt you now. And I get up with the binoculars. And it's there, and, and I look, I look, and it's just over the field. And I think, I think I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'll fight it off. I'm not afraid. And, and I walk, and I, I walk out, and I walk across the road, and, and, and there it is, up there. Oh, God. It, it looks like a, like a big pancake with, with windows, and, and a road of windows, and, and lights. And, not, not lights. Just one, one huge light. Rows of windows? Like a commercial plane? Rows of windows. They're not like a commercial plane, because they curve. They curve around the side of this this pancake, and I said to myself, my God, no, I, I have to shake my head, I, I, I'm good, this can't be true, this isn't here, and there's a man there, is, is he a captain, what, what is he? he, he's looking at me, why, why, what, what do they want, what do they want, and one person looks friendly to me, he's friendly looking, and he's looking at me, over his right shoulder, and, and he's smiling, but, but... Could you see him clearly? Yes. Yes, I could. What did he look like? His face was round, and his eyes were slanted. He had a black scarf around his neck, uh, dangling over his left shoulder, and, and I know this creature is, is telling me something. Telling you something? How? How is he getting it to you? I can see it in his face. No, his lips are not moving, and, and he's just telling me, don't be afraid. I'm going to be... I'm going to be safe. Stay there and keep looking. Just keep looking and stay there. Calm down. How can you be sure he was telling you this? His eyes... His eyes, I've never seen eyes like that before. You said they were friendly. Not the leaders. I said the one looking over his shoulder. 
How did you know the other one was the leader? Because everybody moved. Everybody was standing there looking at me, but everybody moved. These levers were in the back, or, or they, they went to a big board. It, it looked like a board. And only this one with, with a black, black shiny jacket and a scarf stayed at the window. <sighs> Those eyes, <laughs> they're in my brain. There are men standing in the road. Yeah, they won't talk to me. Only the eyes are talking to me. I, I, I don't understand. The eyes don't have a body. They, they're just eyes. And where are you? Are you in the car? No, I'm, I'm just suspended. And I'm just floating about. Oh, funny. Floating about. Just floating. And I, I, I want to get back to the car. Just floating about. You're really floating about? Or is that just the way you feel? That's just the way I feel. You're still outside the car? No, I'm, I'm not in the car. I'm not near the car. I'm not in the woods. I'm, I'm not on the road. All right. We'll stop there. You will be calm and relaxed. You will forget everything that we have had in this period together until I ask you to recall it again. You will forget everything we have talked about until I ask you to recall it again. You are in a deep, deep sleep. Deep asleep. Fully relaxed and far asleep. Very comfortable. Fully relaxed. Deep asleep. Far asleep. Now we're going to go back, back to your vacation in September of 1961, as you were coming from Niagara Falls to Montreal. You will remember what you did, and you will recall everything, all your experiences, all of your memories, all of your feelings, and you will give me all of this in full detail. Now tell me all that you experienced, all that you felt, you and your husband. We're driving along and the streets were wide, the sun was shining. There are quite a few people in the streets, and I was looking at the houses and stores and windows, and we kept driving and looking around. The moon was bright, but not quite full, but very bright and large, and there was a star down below the moon, on the lower left-hand side of the moon. And then right after we had left Lancaster, I noticed that there was like a star, a bigger star up over this one, and it hadn't been there. And I showed Barney, and we kept watching it. It seemed to keep getting bigger and brighter, and we watched it for a while. And I was puzzled by it, also curious. And while I was watching it, Desley was getting somewhat restless. And then we went by a mountain that obstructed the view. And when I got to where I could see the star again, I thought it had moved. I wasn't quite sure, so I kept watching it. And it seemed so it did move. And Desley was restless. So I told Barney we should let Desley out. And it would give us a chance to look at this star through the binoculars. I was looking through the binoculars at the object. And Barney was saying it was like a satellite. But it wasn't. It was moving fast. But when it went in front of the moon and I saw it, I saw it travel across the whole face of the moon. And it was odd shaped. And it was all flashing different colours. How far away would you say it was? It looked at the time it wasn't close to us, but I could see it outlined in front of the moon. And there were searchlights rotating around it. They were bright colours, like a bright orange light, almost like a reddish beam. I saw it go in front of the moon. I was sort of fascinated, but I kept watching. I tried to get Barney to look, and I wanted him to see it before it got away from the face of the moon. But he kept saying, oh, it's, it's a satellite. Round? Shaped like anything you know? A plane? No, not like a plane. All I could think of, um, like a cigar. Like a cigar? Yes, it was long and there weren't any wings. And it was going sideways, you know, like a cigar. It was going from left to right. 
It was just like holding a cigar to the front of the moon, with all these lights flashing around it. So then Barney looked at it, and I took the binoculars and looked again and gave them back to him. And then I went over to put Desley in the car and got in the car myself and shut the door. And then Barney came over and got in the car and he said, they've seen us and they're coming this way. And I laughed and asked him if he had watched Twilight Zone recently on TV. He didn't say anything. Why did you mention Twilight Zone? Had there been anything like this on Twilight Zone? I don't know. I've never seen the Twilight Zone. But I heard people talk about this program, and I was always under the impression that it was a way out type of thing. And so when he said that they could have seen us, and that they were swinging around and coming in our direction, I thought it was his imagination was being overactive. Barney kept saying it was heading towards us. So I thought, well, I don't know what gave him this idea, but I'm beginning to get a little curious why he felt like this. So I picked up the binoculars, and I could see it was getting closer to us, and was coming in. It was turning, it was rotating, and it would go uh, along in a straight line for a short, just a short distance, and then it would tip over on its side and go up. I figured there must be somebody inside of the object, you know, someone directing its light. I just had this feeling that something is going to happen, and I don't know what it is. And I hope I won't be so afraid when it does happen. Now it was fairly close, and I could see that it wasn't spinning, because I could see that there were lights on this one side, and this gave it a blinking and twinkling effect. And then all of a sudden, it stopped doing this. And I got the idea that there were lights only on one side. And then all of a sudden, the object shot ahead of us and swung around in front of the car. Well, I was watching it when it did this, and it was on my side of the windshield, directly in front of me. And I looked at it through the binoculars, and I could see a double row of windows. And then, as I was watching it, I was thinking, this side has the windows, and the back of it must be in the dark. And this is why it twinkles. And while I'm sitting there, I'm amazed by all this. I don't know if Barney was laughing or, or crying, but he was saying that they were going to capture us. And all of a sudden, Barney said, what's that? What's that? What's that noise? And I said, I don't know. All I could think of is some kind of electrical signal, you know, beep. I wondered, oh, darn, why didn't learn Morse code? Because maybe this is the Morse code, and I don't know it. Then I thought, maybe it's electrical, or maybe it's a shock. So I put my hand on the metal of the car, and I kept feeling and, and feeling, and I didn't feel a shock, no kind of electrical shock. But the whole car was vibrating. I, I was afraid when I saw the men in the road men in the road. There were these men standing in the highway and I wasn't too afraid when I saw them. They were standing there and I thought, well, you know, they weren't so awful. There was, um, I, I don't know, they were just, I wasn't too afraid when I saw them and they were just, I couldn't get a good look at them. Then I thought, well, are they in the car? A broken down car? What are they doing here? And these men started to come up with the car. They separated. They came into groups and they started to do that. I, I got really, really scared. And the car motor died and the car stopped. And they started to come towards us. <laughs> he tried to stop the car. I, I won't, it wouldn't start. And the men are coming towards us. And I thought, well, I can get away from them if I get the car to open. And, uh, I can run in the woods uh, and hide. And uh, I'm thinking of that. And I put my hand on the car door to open it. And, and the men come up and they open it for me. <laughs> and then they the And then this man. These <laughs> men.
You needn't be worried. You remember everything now. Tell me what happened. I'm thinking I'm asleep. You're asleep in the car? I'm asleep, and I've, I've got to wake up. I don't want to be asleep. I, I keep trying. I've got to wake myself up, and, and then I do. And I, I open my eyes, and I'm, I'm walking through the woods, and just as I open my eyes quick, and then I shut them again, and even though I'm asleep, I'm walking. And there's this man on the stock, and, and I'm beside And there's two men in front of me. And I look all around, and it's a path, and, and, and there's trees, and uh, I look at these men, and I turn around, and Barney's behind me. Barney's behind you? There's a couple of men behind me, and then there's Barney. There's a man on each side of him. My eyes are open, but Barney's still asleep. He's walking, and he's asleep. And I say to myself, who the heck are these characters, and what do they think they're doing? And I turn around, and I say, Barney, wake up! Barney, why don't you wake up? And he doesn't pay any attention. He, he keeps walking, and going a little bit further, and I turn around, and I say his name again. Barney, wake up! And, and he doesn't pay any attention. And the man walking beside me says, oh, is his name Barney? And that's why I looked at this man, and I figured it's none of his business, so I didn't speak to him. And then we keep walking, and I try to wake Barney up again. I keep saying, Barney, Barney, wake up, and he doesn't. So the man asks me again, is Barney his name? And I wouldn't answer him. So he says, he said, um, don't be afraid. You don't have to, any reason to be afraid. We're, we're not going to harm you. We just... We'll just take you and Barney and put you in the car and you'll be on your way back home in no time. He, I mean, he was kind of assuring in a way and so we kept walking and we came to a clearing. And there was, I wish it were lighter so I could get a, a better picture of it, but there was a ramp to the door and the object was on the ground. The object was on the ground? They're taking me up to the object and I don't want to go on it. I, I don't I don't know what's going to happen if I do. I, I don't want to go, and Barney's no protection. He, he sounds asleep, and I don't want to go on it. He's sound asleep. What was he doing? Walking along, or was somebody supporting him? Yeah, th there's a man on each side. Sort of, his eyes arc shut, and he doesn't hear anything I say, but he's standing on his own two feet, and he's in a daze, and... They're sort of directing him, helping him along, and he's quite a bit taller than the other men. He's taller than the men? Yes, yes. He's way above them. So when we get to the object, I don't want to go on it. And so the man beside me says to go, to get on. He's a little angry with me. He said, oh, go on, the longer you fool around about here, the longer it's going to take. You might as well go on and get over with it, and get back to your car. We haven't got much time either. So he and one of the others each take my arm and I get sort of a helpless feeling. There's not much I can do at this point but to go on with them. So I go up the ramp. I go inside and there's a corridor to the left. We go up the corridor and there's a room. And they stop to take me in the room. I'm standing in the doorway and I turn around and I'm waiting for them to bring Barney in. But they don't do it. They lead Barney right past the door where I'm standing. So I ask them, what are you doing with Barney? You bring him in here where I am. And, they, and the man said, no, we only have enough equipment in one room to do one person at a time. So if we took you both in the same room, it would take too long. So Barney will be all right. They're going to take him into the next room. And then as soon as we get through testing with both of you, then you will go back to your car. You don't have to be afraid. So I, I watched them take Barney into the next room. And I go into this room, and some of the men come in with this man who speaks English. And they stay for a minute, and I, I don't know who they are, I guess maybe they're the crew. But they only stay for a minute, and the man who speaks English is there, and another man comes in. I haven't seen him before. I think he's a doctor, and they come in the door. There's a stool. There's a stool, and they put me on it. I sit on the stool, and they, I have a dress. My blue dress is on, and they push up the sleeve of my dress, and they look at my arm there. They both look at my arm, and then they turn my arm over, and they look at it here, and they, 
and they rub. Uh, they have a machine. I, I don't know what it is. They bring the machine over and put. They put. I don't know what kind of machine. It's something like a microscope, only a microscope with a big lens. And they put. I don't know. They put. I have an idea where they're taking pictures of my skin. And they both looked through this machine here, and then they were talking. I don't know what they were saying. I couldn't understand that part. What they were saying. Then they took something like a letter opener, only it wasn't, and they scraped my arm here. And there was like little, you know how your skin gets dry and flaky sometimes? Like the little particles of your skin? And they put, there was some, there was something like a piece of cellophane or something plastic. And they scraped and they put this and that came off the plastic. Then um, he, the man who spoke English, they both spoke English here, the man who brought me on this contraption is the one who took this, and he took this plastic, and he rolled it all up, and, and he put it in the top drawer. And then they put my head there, like a dentist, well, not like a dentist, something like, you know, the brace of a dentist chair. You have this thing that holds your head, I don't know, it, it seems to pull out the back of the stool, something or other, and they put my head in that. So I'm sitting on a stool, uh, and there's a little bracket, and my head is resting against this bracket. And the examiner opens my eyes, and he looks in them with a light, and he opens my mouth, and looks into my throat, and my teeth, and he looks in my ears, and he turned my head, and he looked, uh, and he looked in this ear, and, and he takes like a, a swab or, or a Q-tip, I guess it is. The one they use on babies, and he cleans it out. He, he puts it in my left ear, and he puts it in on another piece of this material. And the leader takes it and rolls it all up and puts it in the top drawer, too. Oh, and then he feels my hair down by the back of my neck and all. And they take a couple of strands of my hair, and they pull it out and give it to this leader. And he wraps it, uh, he wraps it. He wraps that all up and puts that in the top drawer. Then he takes something, maybe like scissors, I don't know what it is, and he cut, they cut a piece of it and he gives it back to him. And then he feels my neck and he starts feeling behind my ears, under my chin, and down my neck, and in through my shoulders, around my collarbone, and I'm not particularly interested in looking at them, so I try and keep my eyes shut. But no, I do open, and no all the time, just to give myself a little relief. While I'm not looking at them, I, I shut my eyes. And then he takes something, and he goes underneath my fingernail, and then he, I don't know, probably manicures it or something, and he cuts off a piece, a piece of my fingernail. And then the doctor, the examinator, says he, he wants to do some tests. He wants to check my nervous system over the stool and sort of in the middle of the room, there's a table, some kind of table. It's not very high, so I lie down on the table with my back, and he brings over this, um, how can I describe it? Like, they're like needles, a whole cluster of needles, and each needle has a wire going from it. I think it's something like on a TV screen, you know? Uh, when the picture isn't on, you get all these kind of lines, something like that. And so he puts me down on the table, and they bring the needles over, and they don't stick them in me, and no, not really like a sticking needle in a person, but they touch me with needles, and it doesn't hurt. They roll me over on my back, and the examiner has a long needle in his hand, and I see the needle, and it's bigger than any needle I've ever seen before. And I ask him what he's going to do with it. It won't hurt me. And I ask him, and Lie said he just wants to put it in my navel and Yes, there was a light behind.
behind my left shoulder. Then uh, I was grateful to the leader for stopping the pain. And he seemed to be very surprised. And so they said that that was the end of the testing. And the leader helped me to sit up, and he took a hold of my arm, and, and I swung around on the table. And I, oh, I said, I can't, I can go now, I can go back to the car. And he said, Barney isn't ready yet. So then I, I, I began to get worried, and I asked him why it was taking so long with Barney. And he said that they were doing a few more tests with him, but he'd be right along in a minute. So there was just the leader and me. I felt grateful to him because he stopped my pain. And now I wasn't afraid at all. And so I started talking with the leader, and I said to him that this had been quite an experience. It was unbelievable that no one would ever, ever believe me, and that most people didn't know he, he was alive. And what I needed was some proof that this had really happened. So he laughed and he said, what kind of proof do they want? What would I like? And I said, um, well, if you could give me something to take back with me, and then people would believe me. So he told me to look around and maybe I could find something I would like to take, and, and I did. And there wasn't much around, but on the cabinet there was a book, a fairly big book. So I put my hand on the book and I said, could I have this? He told me to look in the book, and I did, and it had pages, it had writing, but nothing like I'd ever seen before. It looked like, I don't know, it, it wasn't a dictionary, but um, it, had, it had the writing, the writing didn't go across, it went up and down. Did it look like any language that you know, or was it in English? No, it, it wasn't English. Then the leader laughed and asked me if I thought I could read it. And I told him no, I laughed too. I said no, but I wasn't taking it to read. But this was going to be my proof that this happened. That this, this was my proof. And so he said that I could have it. I could have the book if I wanted it. And I picked it up and I was delighted. I asked him where he was from. Because I said I, I knew he wasn't from Earth and I wanted to know where he came from. And he asked me if I knew anything about the universe. And I told him no. I knew practically nothing. He went across the room and to the head of the table and he did something. He, he opened up. It wasn't like a drawer. It was, he sort of did something. And the metal of the wall, there was an opening. And he pulled out a map and asked me if I'd ever seen a map like this before. And I walked across the room and I, I leaned against the table and I looked at it. And it was, it, was, it, had a, it was an oblong map. It wasn't square. And there was a lot wider than it was long. And there were all these dots on it, and there were these lines. There were some on the dots, there were, some, there were curved lines going from one dot to another, and there was one big circle, and it had lots of lines coming out and from it. And a lot of lines going to another circle quite close, but not as big. And there were heavy lines. And I asked him what they meant, and he said that the heavy lines were trade routes, and that the other lines, the other lines, the solid lines were places they went on occasion. And he said the broken lines were expeditions. So I asked him, where was his home port? And he said, where were you on the map? I looked, uh, I laughed, uh, I don't know. Uh, and so he said, if you don't know where you are, then there isn't any point in telling me where I am from. And then he put the map, the, the map rolled up, and then he put it back in the space in the wall and closed it. All of a sudden, there's this noise in the hall. Some of the other men came in, and with them is the examiner. They are quite excited, so I asked the leader, what's the matter with them? Did something happen to Barney? It has to, do, it has to be something to do with Barney. The examiner has me open my mouth, and he starts checking my teeth. What are they doing with them? They were tugging, pulling at them. They were very excited. <laughs> The examiner said that they couldn't figure it out. Barney's teeth came out and mine didn't. I was really laughing and I said Barney had dentures and I didn't. And that's why his teeth came out. And so they asked me what are dentures and I said people that got older lose their teeth and uh, they have to go to a dentist and have their teeth extracted and they put in dentures. And he said, well, older, what is older? And I said, old age. And he said, what is old age? And I said, well, it varies, but 
uh, as a person gets older, there are changes in him, particularly physically. He begins to sort of break down with age. And so he said, what is age? What did I mean by age? And I said, the lifespan, the length of time people live. He said, how long is this? And I said, well, I think lifespan is supposed to be about 100 years at the most. People can die before that. Most of the time they do because of disease, um, accidents, this type of thing. I think the average length of time is 65 or 70. So he said, 65 or 70 what? What did I mean? And I said, years. He said, what is a year? Uh, and I said, I did not know exactly how it was figured out, but it had to do with how many days, and the days had so many hours, and the hours had so many minutes, and the minutes had so many seconds. All these things you ask me, I'm a very limited person when trying to talk to you. But there are people in this country who are not like me. They would be most happy to talk with him. They could answer all his questions. And maybe if he could come back, all his questions would have the answers. But if I did, I wouldn't know when to meet him. He, he laughed. He said, don't worry. If we decide to come back, we will be able to find you all right. We'll always find those we want to. And I, and I said, well, now what do you mean by that remark? And he just laughed. And then Barney's coming. Uh, they're bringing Barney out. And I hear the men in the corridor. And I said, Barney's coming. And, they, and he said, yes, you can go back to the car now. And I got the book, and Barney is coming up, and his eyes were still shut. And so it's time to go back to the car. And then he just said, come on, we will walk you back to the car with you. So I said, all right, um, but I do wish I really knew if you were going to come back. And he said, well, we'll see. And then, then we're out in the corridor. Barney's behind me with his eyes shut and a man on each side of him. And I'm all ready to go down the ramp when some of the other men, not the leader, but some of the men are talking. I don't know what they're saying, but they're very excited. And then the leader comes over and takes my book. I told him, you promised I could have the book. And he replied, I know it, but the others object. They don't want you to know what has happened. They want you to forget all about it. At this point, Simon suggests to Betty, after hypnosis, to draw a copy of the star map. Although the map she saw had many stars, she draws only the one she is sure of. The map consists of 12 major stars connected by lines and 3 minor stars, forming a triangle. Betty argues that the stars connected by solid lines form trade routes, while dashed lines refer to less travelled stars. The images you can see are the results of the drawings. The Interrupted Journey book containing this creepy news story is read by the teacher and astronomer Marjorie Fish, who wonders if these drawings can somehow be deciphered so as to be able to discover the origin of these mysterious creatures. Assuming that one of the 15 stars on the map should represent the Earth's sun, Fish builds a three-dimensional model with thread and beads of nearby and similar stars to our Sun capable of allowing life on nearby planets. Basing the stellar distances on those published in 1969 in the Gliese Star Catalogue and studying thousands of observation points over several years, the only one that seems to match Betty Hill's map is attributable to the double star system observation point of Zeta Reticuli about 39 light years from Earth. Fish, at this point, manages to track down Webb, the NICAP investigator who first interviewed the couple. Webb, shocked by the discovery, sends the star map to the editor of the famous magazine Astronomy, Terence Dickinson, who accepts its publication. The subject shakes and enlivens the world for years to come. Time passes and there are endless theories for and against the veracity of Betty's map and the location of Zeta Reticuli. Statistician David Saunders argues that the possibility of a match between 16 stars of specific spectral type among the thousands of stars closest to the Sun is at least 1000 to 1. The next time you look up at the night sky or enter an ancient history museum, 
Remember that in our galaxy alone, there are about 300 billion stars, including at least 5 billion solar systems similar to ours, though perhaps not all of them have a suitable planet for the development of organic organisms, placed at the right distance from the Sun. We can therefore calculate that of these 5 billion, at least 10 million could have these characteristics, and among these 10 million, at least a thousand could have seen the development of a bacterial life form, which, in the worst case scenario, on at least 50 planets, could have evolved into multicellular life forms and intelligent organisms. From this it has been calculated that in the worst case, the possibility that technologically advanced civilizations and alien multicellular organisms exist in our galaxy is equivalent to about 0.1%. This doesn't seem much, but if multiplied by the approximately 500 billion galaxies that are estimated to exist, it becomes, in the most pessimistic hypothesis, 50,000. 50,000 technologically advanced civilizations currently exist in the universe. The next time you look at the night sky observing the celestial bodies, remember that they may be observing you too.